Welcome to Electric Evolution with Liz Allen. This podcast is about the journey to a more sustainable future in order for us to be able to do our bit to achieve net zero. I'll be discussing a variety of topics with experts in their field in order to educate and increase our knowledge of clean energy, electric vehicles and the electric vehicle infrastructure. So whether you're an individual wanting to make a difference at home, a small business or a corporate, this podcast is just for you. So I'm so happy and actually over the moon to have this guest on today. So I have got Toddington Harper, who is the CEO of GridServe. And I'm just going to read a few things, Toddington, before we actually start. So, so he's one of the greatest, I wrote this by the way, one of the greatest innovators in the EV infrastructure and renewable sector, bringing joined up thinking into the equation to provide a plethora of superb products and services to businesses and consumers. So I wanted to write this specifically because I just want to say, I think what you're doing is amazing. So thank you very much for joining me on the podcast and welcome. Great to be here. Thank you. That's quite an accolade. I've uh, got a lot, lot to live up to here. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. So I'm going to start off for those that don't, don't know you. And actually, for those that have watched before, you'll probably remember right back at the beginning when we started releasing these back in December, we had Sam Clark, who's the chief vehicle officer at GridServe. So we've, we've, had, we've had Sam on, but I wanted to make sure. And actually, recently you met my husband. Richard Allen, and he was speaking at your your first uh, conference, wasn't he? So, I want, it was my turn to get hold of you this time. <laughs> so, you were previous chief exec at Belectric UK Solar PV, MD at the Low Carbon Economy. You started GridServe. You founded GridServe in 2017. I just wanted to just get a little bit of context to where you came from and why 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 GridServe. Why did you start it? So, um, I mean, I was kind of born into sustainable energy. Um, mm. I, uh, my father, uh, his, his initial start, you know, uh, in, in his career, when it really took off, he was actually building petrol stations many oh, years right. and then the oil crisis happened and he thought, oh, there's something really wrong here. Set off around the world, um, in search of uh, a better, more sustainable solution. Um, it was more, more about commercially sustainable at that time rather than, uh, environmentally. Um, and discovered solar energy uh, and batteries and and so and actually in the Middle East of all places and so I grew up in Bahrain surrounded by solar panels batteries and all sorts of stuff and and the world made a lot of sense um, energy came from the Sun um, it powered everything it was all <laughs> it, it all made sense and then eventually I uh, I ended up at school in England and I was taught in a geography lesson I remember it very clearly that where does energy come from? Like, I know it comes from solar power and it comes from the wind. And I was, you know, teacher looked at me like I was a complete Martian and, uh, and said, no, 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 I don't know what you're, I don't know what he's talking about. That crazy guy, uh, energy comes from fossil fuels. And, uh, and I just thought, well, what are they? That sounds very strange. And then learned, um, you know, learned a lot about it. And actually the, the thing that I should have, you know, highlighted to him at the time, which, um, uh, which I didn't really understand at the time, and I certainly he, he didn't. Is actually all the energy in fossil fuels originally came from the sun, um, and so we were all in this. It's actually the sun. I think I was right, <laughs> but uh, you were right, yeah. But, 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 but anyway, and then uh, and so I've spent the last you know all of the companies that you talked about. Um, one thing is is in common that I that I founded them. Um, at least the UK arm of of Belectric, but certainly all the other companies, low carbon economy. Um, uh, 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 Belectric UK, uh, GridServe, um, and actually a company before that called Fuel Cell Markets and the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Industry, which is where originally I was thinking that the world's sustainable energy solutions were, were met, although later discovered that there's a lot of complexity in that. Um, but yeah, it's been a journey of discovery to try and, I guess, get back to the starting point that I had, which is that energy does come from the sun. Uh, it's clean, it's, it works, it's all nicely balanced, and it's what the world needs. Um, and I've been building various businesses along the journey to get there, to get back there, actually. Yeah. And, and actually just looking at what GridServe is doing, looking at, you know, I'm kind of researching GridServe in a bit more, in a bit more detail, um, knowing that I was going to actually have you on here. And I just wanted to get you to explain a little bit about the various offerings that you're providing as an organization and who to. 
Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, maybe I'll start kind of quite quite macro on what what it is we're trying to do. So, mm. the purpose of GridServe and actually being involved in in the kind of environmental sector, or the sustainable energy sector for for so long, um, you know, really has brought me closer and closer to the uh, the underlying science of of climate change, and and that's what you know. Well, I was fortunate enough to meet to meet Richard Allen recently. He came to speak at, at our event, being a professor climate science at, at Reading University, um, and um, you know the the issue is that we we unfortunately the inconvenient truth, which is a great line that Al Gore uh, explained to us many years ago, um, is that fossil fuels, uh, despite all the incredible benefits they can bring societies in terms of you know uh, power, you know lighting transport all these all these things that we, we kind of take for granted um the inconvenient truth is that uh there are um you know horrific uh um there's horrific pollution emissions caused from the burning of of these and actually at some point they're going to run out anyway as well yeah. um and so what we need to do is we need to transition um uh from this you know this solution and actually the bit that we focus on in grid serve uh, is that is the area around transport uh, and mm -hmm. how we summarize that is well to wheel so um, the you know the modern transport system you know, by and large is uh, that kind of covers most of it so we we, we harvest energy we, we produce energy um, from oil wells or I guess it's more accurate to say we release energy from oil wells because actually the energy in oil as, as I tapped into originally came from the sun absorbed by plants and algae hundreds of millions of years ago but we, we, we nonetheless dig the oil out of the ground, release the sun's energy. It's got a lot of gunk uh, combined in those hundreds of millions of years. It needs to be refined, so we need to refine that energy in batteries. Uh, it needs to be transported, often long distances, in pipelines and tankers. Uh, again, it's a pretty inefficient way to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's um, through, uh, through you know, additional tankers and then petrol forecourts, uh, and ultimately put into, um, put into combustion engine cars and burnt. Um, and it's the result and it's that whole system that uh, enables all these incredible benefits but it's that system that creates the pollution and so what we are trying to to work out um or have been trying to work out uh, is how can we provide another system that provides um all of the same benefits that we get from the modern transport system but without the um, without the environmental consequences and all of the polit political shenanigans and, and, and complexities that that come from that as well. And so uh, that's what we're doing and we're creating a system, uh, a net zero equivalent of well to wheel and it's called sun to wheel. So instead of oil wells, we're building solar farms and solar farms harvest the sun's energy. So it's the same energy, just you skip the 300 million or so years to make it. Um, we refine it, we make it more useful in batteries. So we're you know, delivering quite large battery projects that um, store the energy and actually balance the grid as well and enable us to use you know the energy 24 7. Uh, mm -hmm. We distribute it through through the grid um, and also directly through cables it's a lot more efficient way to than pipelines and tankers um, uh, and we then uh, you know, we, we, we put it into we distribute the energy into electric vehicles with both electric forecourts um, uh, you know like a petrol station but but purely electric uh, and and you know designed for the needs of electric vehicle drivers and also electric hubs. So we've got charters on, on more than 80% of the motorway network. Um, uh, and um, and ultimately into electric cars. And so we also assist the uptake of electric cars through leasing electric vehicles, enabling people to do test drives, learn about them, and, uh, and you know give people the confidence to kind of make the switch. So that's the system, sun to wheel, that's what we're building. Uh, and I guess the interesting thing about GridServe is we're building it um, in line with the science, addressing the science of climate change. Um, uh, and you know, and ultimately, focusing on where do emissions need to be to um, to prevent temperature rises exceeding 1.5 degrees. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you know, and, and ultimately, we haven't got very long. We've probably got around a decade, if we're lucky, um, in order to you know to stop uh, carbon emissions being released to the extent we lose our use up our remaining carbon budget. Um, temperatures exceed yeah. already about 1.1. But whichever way you look at it, what well, means we need to go really, really quickly. So everything we're building in terms of sun to wheel, we're also doing it with a view to working out how we can replicate that system um, in other territories as well, outside of the UK, um, with other partners, 
uh, as quickly as possible um, and and ultimately quick enough to uh, to um, you know to be that generation of of you know of, of people us collectively that actually make the difference um, because because what you know concerns me a, a lot uh, and I'm sure you in the podcast and certainly your your husband um, is that uh, we all just kind of live in a bit of a bubble you know it, it's it is an inconvenient truth climate change um, and it and it's it just does, almost doesn't feel real you know like how can it humans have kind of we control everything we've tamed the planet we tamed everything how is it possible that this isn't within our control and is it really realistic that, that this is happening and is it happening this quickly that that you know that it's literally left to us and unfortunately the answers to all of those things are it, it is real um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the world's leading scientists in the IPCC the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the top panel of, of UN scientists around the world, including you, your husband, who contributed to that, to that, um, have uh, have you know got have got you know together and said, look, this is this is unfortunately real, um, and we have to address it as quickly as possible. Uh, and what that basically means, if it's the next ten years, is it means people like you, Liz, people like me, people who are living and able today, and we are the ones that history will judge. Um, and I want to be one of the people that, when history does judge us, go, wow, weren't those people amazing? They, they turned this around, you know, against all odds, against everything, all the inertia, everything was going the wrong way. And mm -hmm. wow, look, so it's quite a long answer to your question, but in summary, that's what the outcome we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve it for transport, and we're doing that by delivering sun to wheel. It's, it's so important what you're saying and what, what you're actually doing, because cause you're right. Um, I think there's a lot of denial still. There's been a lot of denial about climate change for years. And as you, as you know, my husband's kind of, well, you might not know this. So he came across a, a lot of kind of climate skeptics in the past who were starting to embrace it a little bit more, you know, thank goodness, because it was, it was, sometimes it was, it was quite difficult, especially for him, you know, to, to actually get it, get it on the chin all the time, you know, where you have these, these people who are in denial but but yeah you're right I think um, it's it is definitely down to us we have to make we have to make a difference I, I definitely know what you mean so um, as I said I've been doing this for quite a while I was at the mm. it was COP 15 in Copenhagen in 2009 yeah. um, where it was just a complete stitch up so it was at a period it was a period in time it was you know we have the paris agreement but it was actually meant to be the copenhagen agreement and all the world's leaders um you know all of the egos were in the room and definitely there were um and uh, and they'd come to put pen to paper but it was a very difficult period because it was incredibly expensive to make clean energy versus fossil fuel energy um it was um you know and so people didn't they were holding the pens they didn't want to sign and uh, and there was just so much, you know, so much uh, misinformation. I guess we call it fake news these days. But uh, there was yeah. so much misinformation being being produced. And, and the thing that I always remember about that as well is this: a few weeks before, this thing came out in the newspapers, and it was called Climate Gate, you know. And it was the University of East Anglia climate scientists, and these scientists have been hacking, you know, they, they've been hacked, and they've discovered that the that the climate, the, the science, the data is incorrect, and these scientists have been manipulating data to get budgets for their research. It was just extraordinary, and it just came. It just came like like a volcano at everybody, and nobody questioned. The newspapers didn't question. Wait, 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 wait. Is it? Where's this coming from? Which mean they got hacked, and like these evil scientists. Play. And and what it did, it was just part of the. What it did is it, it was just part of the, you know, final straw. It felt like to give these politicians the excuse to put the pens down. Because if there was doubt in the science of climate change, and because it was gonna cost money, basically, because fossil, you know, GDP is underpinned by the price of energy. If energy, if it costs you more to get produce clean energy than fossil energy, then um, it was gonna be an expensive thing to do. And if the science wasn't proven, and if there was doubt, then I tell you what, we can put our pens down and not make unpopular decisions. So yeah, I, I remember it well, it was actually that, that event that actually made me completely um, pivot because I was running this, this business with low carbon economy, trying to um, mm. put pieces of the low carbon jigsaw together, and I it just I was just like they're not ready. The pieces are not ready to be connected because it's too expensive to make clean energy. What we need to do is we need to make it cheaper, and 
uh, and that's why I then picked solar energy and that's when I then picked a company who was called Beck Energy at the time but the reason I picked them um, uh, was because they were working with a form of a, a solar technology called thin film it's before the Chinese kind of like massive you know manufacturing and solar had, had, had even started and this company because I, I built this platform low carbon economy to connect all the pieces of the jigsaw together that's actually why I was at Copenhagen because I was working with the UN on a project to, to do all of that okay. um, and um, uh, and they had this thin film and uh, technology which basically meant that they could produce so they were on a path to producing solar energy cheaper than anybody else and I and I was like that's got to be the answer so I, I knocked on the door of the, the, these people I'd met them once someone at once at an event and I said look I just I just really need to work with you <laughs> you know I think you've got a solution that, that addresses some of the world's biggest challenges um, and uh, you know of all the solutions out there I think solar is the one that's going to reduce cost first and I think you've got the version of that is there anything I can do and they said well yeah there is um, uh, you know we're about to we think about opening up the market in the UK would you like to to work with us there so I said uh, okay uh, why not? So we, we created a joint venture. Um, I didn't know much about them at the time. They didn't know much about me at the time. I was kind of used, you know, we had an existing team which we pivoted into into that. Um, and we used our offices and worked with them. I figured they knew more about solar than, than, than we you know, than we did and they were clearly a much bigger company. Mm -hmm. um, so they had the majority. We were a shareholder, uh, you know, a significant major, you know, minority shareholder. Um, and then much to my amazement, um, about 12 months in, uh, there was a survey that was done of all the all of the leading solar businesses in the world. And they added the wall up as to how much uh, each one of them had um, had delivered. And much to all of our amazement that they were now, Beck Energy became known as Belectric. They renamed themselves as Belectric. And Belectric was the world market leader. So uh, I suddenly find myself running the UK arm and a significant jail in the world market leading solar business. And actually it was, it was because of thin film that they'd got to that position. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I thought, crikey, I, I get a, I, I guess, guess I really better get to the bottom of this. And so we, you know, we had a great team. We, we had, we, you know, we built a lot. It was all a subsidized marketplace, but that, that's how we, we ended up, um, uh, you know, uh, delivering electric. So you made a good choice, a very good choice, didn't you, to actually to to kind of go with that joint joint venture? What year was it again? So it's quite a long time ago. So we started in two thousand and ten. So so yes. Copenhagen was yeah. two thousand nine. Two thousand and ten was uh, you know was the start of it. Two thousand and eleven and twelve, Belectric were the world market leader. It continued all the way up till I think we we sold the business to actually. Um, Energy RWE in uh, in December 2016, and that was at a time when um, the solar industry had all been subsidised, and um, and that's actually most people in the solar industry only knew subsidised solar, um, mm -hmm. uh, whereas um, I had only known non-subsidised solar, <laughs> you know, because that my, right. my father was building solar projects with batteries for telecom infrastructure. Uh, and actually cathodic protection of oil pipelines and so on in the Middle East. So I found solar, I found subsidies quite an odd thing to do, to be paid money from the government for producing energy. I, I thought that was a bit bit of an odd thing, personally. Um, and it created a lot of disruption. Um, mm, okay. And when the subsidies reduced, um, uh, a lot of people who had only ever been in the solar in the subsidy era figured that that was the end of solar. Whereas, from my perspective, um, we got to a point where solar was now so cheap it could outperform other solutions in terms of pure economics and so I figured that we'd only just got started and uh, and so it was a good good parting you know a good time to move on uh, energy was looking to uh, get into the solar business so the whole business was sold including uh, the UK arm um, and on the back of that I had the funding and created GridServe. What a story love it oh my goodness so so there's there's a number of um, areas that you've you've spoken about um, when in kind of talking about GridServe. Do you want to just explain because I haven't seen this yet? Will you talk about the electric forecourts? Because I know I know, I know you've I talked about it a little bit, but where did that idea come from? Is it because it's kind of based on 
the the sort of the the ice vehicle force for courts or or was it was it something else that made you think actually this 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 model will work yeah i mean so it's, i think it's based again on the overall theme of sustainable energy um mm. and uh so i, I um I did a lot of driving around when you build a lot of solar farms. We, we built hundreds of megawatts of solar farms in the UK. We did some very mm. cool things as well. We turned solar farms into nature sanctuaries to protect species. We did a lot of you know, climate, 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 you know, um, uh, you know, kind of um, nature sanctuary scientists and bee pollen, you know, bee scientists. And, and, and it was a it was a pretty um, it was a pretty awesome um, uh, venture. Um, and, um, you know, those miles that took me were kind of grating on me, traveling from place to place to place. Um, uh, and, and I just figured, you know, I'm using a lot of petrol and diesel here. And actually then we constructed the solar projects themselves that also use, you know, a lot of fuel. Um, I just think, you know, there's got to be a better, better solution here. And, uh, one of my colleagues in and grid server just got one of the early teslas i went out to see them on a business trip they took me for a ride without any warning accelerated from 0 to 60 in about three seconds and i was like Whoa! <laughs> uh but you know head was like a fishbowl for like the next <laughs> fact, a fishbowl. <laughs> uh, i can come back to that um, or uh for the next um you know few days but nonetheless i thought wow this is it i've seen the future uh i put a deposit down um no ability, no knowledge at that point how I was going to afford the rest of the car, but I, I figured I'd work it out, um, and I did. Involved selling a solar farm, um, <laughs> which is it certainly did, uh, and um, developing it, building it, selling it, uh, and um, you know, and, and so I transitioned in 2014 uh, into an electric car, and as I said, it was you know it was a big thing for me at the time, and it was the most expensive thing I'd ever bought, and you know everyone thought I was pretty nuts because I was like you know not only am I transitioning but that's the end I'm, I'm not buying I'm not doing petrol and diesel anymore that that's it mm. and I'm pretty clear about that uh, including to my, my my darling wife who uh <laughs> who got subjected to to, to to so many crazy experiences as a result of that <laughs> it, it just wasn't easy to drive an electric car and I did some you know pretty crazy things we went to the south of France and back um you know in, you? in summer of 2014 and very nearly didn't make it on many occasions. Um, uh, the Tesla supercharger network didn't really exist. It was a Tesla, it was a very basic Model S, an amazing car, but it didn't have the brains. It had like the body, but the brains was later to come, uh, I, I learned. Um, right. uh, and the there was some chargers, actually, Ecotricity, the, the original version of the electric highway, which we now, uh, you know, we, we were past the reins from, from Dale Vince, um, was how I got around. Um, but it was difficult. It was difficult. It was hard to use. You needed a lot of, a lot of bits of plastic in your pockets to charge. Sometimes chargers worked. Sometimes they didn't. It was quite hairy, and I had some pretty hairy experiences. What I was very sure, though, is that this was going to be the future. And uh, but but I also thought that um, there's no way that the mass market, and and again back to the sums, back to the mass. If you want to get to mm. Uh, you know, to, to scale, you have to really serve huge numbers of people, and there's no way that mm. small numbers of people are going to tolerate what I've been through. So we were trying to work out how is it possible to build infrastructure that's fit for the mass market, and we figured that you know something called an electric forecourt um, was uh, was the solution, which is you know a little bit like a, a petrol forecourt but a modern version. Um, and it's designed around the needs of electric vehicle drivers, i.e. you're going to be there probably for around half an hour, which, you know, yeah. validated to be about, about right now. Um, and so how do you serve the needs of that customer for half an hour? How, how do you make it so that the charging experience isn't just kind of free of anxiety, which is, you know, was an issue and is an issue in certain cases, but actually is better, is awesome. You know, how do you create a great environment that someone can say, I've got an electric car, wow i don't even have to visit these do you remember those things called petrol stations god they were like oh they were like oh and you had to go to a counter and you had to like and smelly <laughs> and throw give them some coins or notes or now cards or you know and then you're like oh do you remember that you know that was a bit that was a bit quirky in fact the, the, it's really funny because um it didn't take very long 
before it all feels quirky. Like when I go in a petrol or a diesel car now, it's you know, it, it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's odd. I mean, you go to a petrol station, you're like, this is this is interesting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I remember this. Um, but but you know, how do we make it for EV that people want to go to in into electric cars again? Because back to the science of climate change, you know, 1.1 degrees of warming. Um, 1.5 degrees of warming is, you know, we all already know how horrific 1.1 is. So UK 40 degrees temperatures last year, heat waves, waves across Europe, uh, uh, you know, incredible horrific floods uh, in in Pakistan, 33 million people out of their homes, uh, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfire fires, blah, you know, and then uh, and uh, and we're at 1.1. We're going to exceed two degrees of warming on our trajectory, and, and, and at two degrees of warming, 99% um, of all the world's coral reefs cannot survive. And that's why I have behind me a side project I'm working at to build a synthetic coral reef using nothing out of the sea, and it's, okay. it's tricky. Um, and so, you know, we need to sort of deliver at speed and scale. So I figured that electric forecourts would be a solution that would give people the confidence to do it. And that's important because, you know, I think there's like a carrot and a stick approach to, to delivering change. You know, the, the government, I think, has the role a bit more of the uh, of the stick. You know, we're going to ban from diesel cars by such and such a day. But do people do things like some of them? You ha have to eventually begrudgingly. But, you know, what we were kind of thinking was, how do we create, create the carrot? You know, how people go I want to get an electric car because they're just brilliant. This charging infrastructure is so great and everything works. It's brilliant. Like, how do you do that? And so mm -hmm. we really went to town and think, well, let's go and build an electric forecourt that just knocks it out of the park and also acts as a place where we can learn about electric cars and take test drives, and things that we're, we're doing and we've got M&S and, and WH Smiths and Costa Coffee and, you know, it's a pretty cool place. And so I think, um, have you been? Have you been to one? Yeah. Do you know, actually, so I'm going to tell you this in, so when we're recording this, this, this is in April and in about three four weeks time we're going we're going over we're coming over to braintree oh, awesome because i have been talking to one of your one of your colleagues i'm going to give him a shout out now harrison beckwith i've been talking oh, to really? harrison oh, brilliant about about leasing this is all i'm hearing this the first time about what sorry um about leasing so so we're actually going to come over to the electric forecourt in braintree and we're going to take a couple of cars out for test drives because Amazing. my husband husband because as you as you probably know when you met him he came to your conference to speak he got he walked he got the bus he got the train do you know what i mean he that's kind of how he how he works he doesn't like you know he'd rather keep away from cars because he's not you know he'd rather kind of walk places or cycle or whatever but so he's not actually been in an ev yet whereas i have so so i've been talking to and we know we haven't spoken about this um but i've been talking to harrison about about leasing so i'm going to come over and i can't wait there will be lots of photos on social media i will tell you that now <laughs> brilliant. brilliant well that's that's just great and and again you know and it was a test drive that that got me into the confidence to get an electric car and again i figured that that's that that's you know, it's not just me figuring out, we, we, you know, we've learned from lots of other people that that's, that's, that's the eureka moment, isn't it? When people kind of go, yeah. ooh, ooh, you know. <laughs> that's what like, I want to, yeah, yeah, I want to see Richard's face. I want to see Richard's <laughs> face when he actually sits behind the wheel of one, because I've done it, you know, and I want to see, I want to see his face and see what he thinks, because, you know, but it, it was, it was you guys that I was wanting to kind of just try it out with so i've been yeah uh, like i say for him with him and i want to see the electric forecourt because and braintree is a couple of hours away from us from reading um but it's uh, to me it's 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 worth doing it brilliant well that's that's awesome and uh yeah and hopefully you'll you'll agree that um you know for a, a first first forecourt it was you know i think we did a pretty reasonable job and and it really has inspired a lot of people confidence the amount of people Who've uh, who've become you know who've transitioned to electric vehicles in the Braintree area is significantly higher mm. than the country average. Mm. As a, you know, we've got a great relationship with the council, who've been uh, you know creating a whole range of kind of electric mobility programs. Um, uh, you know, it's become a real nexus for EV. That the, the post office has transitioned its fleet, its local depot to electric vehicles. Um, Have they? Fabulous. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, mate, specifically because we built an electric forecourt there. Love it. Build it so and they will so how many charge points are there in the forecourt? So are the same number of charge points that you've got in, in Braintree as you've got in Norwich as well? Uh, so there's actually, yeah, uh, the overall numbers, yeah, but slightly different ratios of different types, but we've got 36 chargers. Um, there's 24 high power chargers. Um, yeah. I guess the difference between Braintree is we had two types of chargers, 350 kilowatt chargers and then 90 kilowatts up to 180. Um, you know, believe it or not, when we were considering that, you know, 50 kilowatts was considered the norm. And I was mm. like, uh, 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 not sure about that. Uh, and, and then we went with 90 and then immediately we felt that that wasn't enough. And so Norwich has got 22 charges because the, the, right. the charge is underneath. Um, and, uh, and we have two larger mobility spaces, um, for people with, um, mobility needs. Um, Brilliant. But and then we've got 22 of those, but they are 350 kilowatt. They're all 350 in Norwich, and then we've got Tesla superchargers there as well, and then we've got some AC chargers as well, which cater for um, for you know older vehicles and also people who are going to be there for a longer longer period of time. So lots and lots of chargers. Um, yes. Uh, and, that's uh, amazing I've, I've seen photos and it does look fantastic i've got to say it re it really does you know making it a very different experience for people you know so you so you have so people can actually um go onto your website can't they and actually you know um register for a test drive if they can get to braintree or or they, or they can get to norwich can't they yeah they can and, and we're also um you know we built it in such a way that we can offer that uh, to you know other electric forecourts as well so we, we've got a site in construction at Gatwick we've got a, uh, we're about to start construction the site in Stevenage we've got about I don't know, seven or eight with the planning permission but we also have uh, sites across the motorway network so in fact near to you I don't know if you've been to Reading East and West mo you know, recently. Um, yeah, I meant I meant to actually go because I was going to get. I am going to get some pics of it, but I know that I know that you're at both sides, east and west, aren't you? So I will I will be having a look. But I've seen I've seen a number of um, grid serve charges because because I'm originally from Halifax in West Yorkshire. I was home for a um, school reunion uh, just over a week ago, um, and so I I stopped a few times at different. And, and bear in mind, right? Okay, so so like I say, we are still driving an ice vehicle. We're, we're going the whole, um, as I, I kind of said to you right at the beginning, that part of this podcast in the first place is to kind of um, follow our journey. So so actually you're you're talking to me the day before we actually get um, solar panels installed. Amazing. We're also getting a battery cha battery storage installed and we're also getting an EV charger installed in the house, which I can't even tell you how excited I'm about, I, I am at the moment. I mean, they're, they're all kind of in various parts of the house and outside and things like that. So we kind of try not to trip over them <laughs> at the moment, but it's just really, really exciting. No, well, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'll, I'll come back. I'll just brief about say on, uh, on test drive. So we're also looking at whether we, oh, yes, can, we can provide them from other locations as well, because we've got, you know, lots of charges. So uh, 12, 350 kilowatt charges on each side, each side of Reading, East and West. Um, but you mentioned your home, so I did a, I rebuilt my home um, as well. Uh, actually, my, 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 my wife did most of the, the hard work. I, I added a complexity, um, but I wanted to work out how we could um, uh, run, uh, uh, you know, completely not on fossil fuels. So we, we yeah. basically banished all fossil fuels. Uh, the, the one thing that I was I'm still can't quite get my head around is not having a gas barbecue because I'm, I'm I'm trying to persuade somebody to, to make <laughs> to make some sort of biomethane or biogas that I can use and I can get get it back because I, I did quite like that. But uh, the absence of that, everything else is just so much better. Um, so we've got a, a a heat pump, it's actually a ground source heat pump, uh, and that's just that's phenomenal. Right. We've got lots of solar power uh, on different different angles of the roof, so we've got energy. Yeah produced in the morning on the east and then the south and in the afternoon and the west in the evening we've got lots of batteries um and uh you know got lots of gadgets in the house and do love a good gadget um and uh, and it's great and you know lots of energy demand two electric cars uh, and you know huge proportion of our energy is uh, is produced just from our own our own uh, our roof in fact i think i see for an average solar installation in the uk um you can probably produce around um 
10,000 miles of charge per year, which is basically oh, most of the energy someone would probably probably need um, from an yeah. average domestic route, which is just amazing, isn't it? You know, what a, what a cool thing to be able to do. It's, a, it's fabulous. I just love that. You know, because I mean, I, I don't think I probably um, do much more than 10,000 10, miles anyway. Like I said to you, I've been working over where you are currently over in Beaconsfield. So it's kind of Reading to Beaconsfield, Reading to Maidenhead, Reading to Uxbridge, kind of going around those those different places. So, so you know, I, I think I worked out it's probably, it is probably about, you know, 10,000 miles, an odd long trip, you know, kind of up to Halifax and back, or if we go, we go kind of on holiday in the UK or whatever. But, but yeah, I can't see it's it's going to be much longer than that. Solar's, solar's incredible. So let me give you some more solar stats. Because I've, on, I've, tell I've, me. Built, I've built lots of solar uh, projects. So um, here's a really amazing one. Um, for every acre of land, so if you're driving along and you see solar farms in fields, yeah. Um, and you think, well, I wonder what that does. And you'll go, to, that's England. Is it really, you know, can you really make much energy from solar in England? You know, you get these kind of questions from people. So for every acre of land in the UK that you can put solar farms on, you can produce enough energy, roughly on average, more in some places, less than others, um, for around, in fact, in excess generally, of a million miles of EV charging per year per acre of land. What? Oh, that's not a statistic. So uh, and and you know and we've got proof. I've done this lots of times. You know we we build a lot of this. Uh, and so the, solar is actually also an energy security benefit too, because that's a million miles of charging per year per acre that you don't need to bring from elsewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then people say, well, what about the land? You know, what about that land? You know, surely it should be used for agriculture. Um, well, of course we need to grow food uh, as as well. Um, um, and uh, you know, we we only build solar projects in low grade agricultural soil. But actually, we did some statistics, and if you covered around half of one percent, so not even one percent, half of one percent of the land in the UK with solar panels, you could produce enough energy every year for roughly uh, the three hundred and thirty-ish billion miles of, of of road miles that the UK drives per year. Oh my God! Half of one percent. And we've done that by looking at you know how many miles per kilowatt hours you know kilowatt hour miles per kilowatt hour uh, for for cars for motorbikes for buses for lorries for trucks and all of that wow. you know, to look used government data you analyze this against solar data and of course you wouldn't have to make it all from the sun in reality because you know you, we'd use wind we'd use other sources but just to give people an idea of it half of one percent is enough equivalent to produce enough energy for the energy security benefit for the country of all the 330-ish billion road miles driven in the UK every single year forever without any producing carbon. God. Is that nuts? That's, that's uh, amazing. I, I assume so. So right, okay. How does because you are you are Mr. Solar now in my mind. Okay, so you've got to explain to me, you've got to help me with this bit. Right. So, so obviously you're, you're, so, and, and we are, we are having 10 solar panels put on the roof tomorrow. Um, we've got the battery. So, so your solar farms, yeah. do they actually have massive battery storage next? How do they actually, how, you know, you're saying from sun to wheel. So how does it get from your solar farm to, to an individual who has an EV? yeah for example yeah so there's two ways um and and also don't let me forget the point about that half of one percent of land what do you, what else can you do with it <laughs> that's an important one too Ooh. um so there's two ways so uh so the target that we need to, that the government has set by 2050 is to get to net zero carbon emissions yes. which yes. basically means you know, the, 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 what would be really good is if we could get to zero carbon emissions, because mm -hmm. that's ultimately what we need to be at. We need to be stopping to add carbon in the air. Yeah, not netting it off against something. All that amazing carbon dioxide that the plants and animals, you know, animals, sorry, plants absorbed out of the air hundreds of millions of years ago and, you know, stored as, as fossil fuels, we push back into it. We need to stop, stop doing that. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and 
Um, but, but unfortunately, the reality is that we, there will be fossil fuels emitted else, you know, in places. So net zero is we need to get to zero carbon emissions as much as possible. And for those that we do emit, we need to pull a mount out of the air, you know, at the same time. So it's a tricky thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, it's a net is kind of where balancing, you know, the overall effect is, is zero. So we do net zero in the context of grid connected solar projects and our high highway. So, for example, we have charges across, you know, all across the UK, 170 odd locations. Um, and every kilowatt hour that we take out of the grid in whatever location we, we, we have, we net off against the zero carbon kilowatt hour that goes into the grid in another location. So, for example, if it's a solar project, um, then, uh, you know, you produce a kilowatt hour of solar in one location, which you net off against a, a kilowatt hour of solar that's, you know, a kilowatt hour of electricity that's put into a vehicle in another location. Yeah. So it's not necessarily the same kilowatt hour, um, yeah. but it's the same amount of energy and that's net zero. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that we're doing. Um, what we're also doing, though, is is the zero carbon kilowatt hour. So we are building solar projects adjacent to our charging infrastructure, um, combined with batteries, um, and we are uh, enabling, you know, that, that kilowatt hour of, of, of energy harvested from, from the sun, we can store it in a battery and put it directly into an electric vehicle. Mm. And that's, that's a zero carbon kilowatt hour. And it's a combination of those two. You know, in fact, on your home, uh, you would be in the zero carbon category, which is great uh, because you would be, you know, either. Did you say you're getting a battery as well, or or yeah, not? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So exactly that. So you'd be in the zero zero carbon kilowatt hour club, which is super. It's so ex it's so exciting. It's a lot. The great thing is, is that you know, solar energy is is now not expensive. In fact, it's a lot cheaper than grid energy. And every kilowatt hour um, that you uh, that you um, can. Uh, generate yourself is going to save you a lot more money than if you have to buy it from the grid uh, in addition to that. So there's a real economic incentive as well as an energy security benefit uh, as well as an environmental benefit. Oh yeah, speaking of which, the point I was making about, you know, so if people might say, but you know, half of 1%, you know, some people might take in a, a view to that's a reasonable number for all the all of the transport needs of, of the country or all the 330 million billion EV miles per year. Um, but again, people might say, well, it's still a lot of land. Um, isn't there anything better you could do with that land? Um, and the great thing about solar energy is it's not an either or. You can do both and because the other, you know, pretty devastating um, again, which is comes back to, to why I've got a, a synthetic coral reef that I'm uh, in the early stages of building here, is that in the last 50 years, uh, according to the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, um, over uh, over 70% of the world's wildlife has been wiped out. Mm. So um, in the last 50 years, 70% of the world's wildlife has been wiped out. And unfortunately, what climate change is going to do is it's going to make it even harder, even if humans did, you know, stop causing this. Um, climate change is just going to make it much harder for nature to survive. Uh, when the climate is changing underneath people's feet yeah. and, and so on and so forth. So um, we need to give nature a chance. Um, I learned a huge amount about in the process about um, about building solar farms and nature. I nearly made some, you know, unintended, uh, <laughs> you know, unintended, um, you know, I issues about planting the wrong wildflowers, the wrong, you know, bees in the wrong mm. place, whatever, because I, I learned that there isn't actually a, a problem with bees um the problem is that the bees well you know the, the bees habitats being destroyed and they don't have very much to eat because bees eat pollen and yes. uh and if there are no wildflowers so so we go and, and i was wrapped on my knuckles by a bee scientist who basically told me when i was telling him i was like oh, i need to get some bees and put them on my solar farms and what are you doing you're crazy and he basically accused me of um of, uh, of being on a mission to starve local bees. Oh, God. And I was like, huh? What are you talking about? And he's like, that's what you're going to do. You're going to starve bees. Is that what you want? And I was like, no, 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 you got me wrong. You got me wrong. I don't want to starve any bees. I want to help. And he said, look, you see a, you see a rolling hill in the countryside. You see this kind of green and pleasant land. Um, you know, what does that look like to you? It looks beautiful, doesn't it? I'm like, well, yeah, we love that. You know, beautiful, 
you know, country views and green hills. And he goes, now, now imagine you're a bee. What do you see? And I was like, well, I don't know. What, what do you mean? And he's like, well, what do bees eat? And then I had to be, be educated as to the fact that they eat pollen and, and ultimately flowers. And he said, well, how many of those do you see in these green and rolling hills? And yeah, uh, in the eyes of a bee, it's basically a desert. And the issue that our modern agricultural practices that we are so aggressively uh, trying to basically you know extract as much value out of that land as possible typically lower grade agriculture we're damaging this the the, the soil uh, quality with da dam damaging all sorts of elements of it we're using insecticides pesticides all sorts of mm -hmm. stuff to try and grow these crops at the expense of nature um and that's you know that's what's wiping out um huge swathes of, of wildlife um and and pollinating insects and, and when you go and build a solar farm you don't need to do any of that you can say you know this land now we don't do any of that we're going to give we're going to make this a sanctuary for nature literally we're going to let grasses grow actually that makes the solar farms carbon negative as well because mm. when you grow grasses they the roots go into the ground that extracts carbon from from the air so they become carbon negative you can then uh, you know you can plant wildflowers and actually just let wildflowers grow and it's incredible nature recovers so quickly we, we saw this in the pandemic um and um, wouldn't it be amazing, you know, like we would create basically the biggest nature sanctuaries across the UK at the same time as producing all this amazing energy. And actually then to complete the jigsaw, if we use some of that energy to grow plants in vertical farms, then, you know, we could grow vastly more uh, produce than we would otherwise be able to grow in half of 1% of the UK's land um, and produce all the benefits of transport. So I reckon it's like lots and lots of wins there. And uh, in summary, solar is, is, is awesome, you know, particularly when it comes to electric vehicles. Yeah, but, you know, I haven't even thought about what you, until you said about the, the bee, you know, the bee chap. I really didn't think about the fact that, yeah, green fields look amazing, don't they? But if they're not there, if there's no flowers, then what do the bees eat? So that's really interesting to think about. Goodness me. And about oh. a third of, a third of, food apparently that we eat roughly speaking i never quite got anybody to give me a clear answer because i'm quite a literal person okay what third what does that mean um but but roughly speaking uh, it it would appear around a third of all mouthfuls of food uh, you've got pollinating insects to thank for and uh, and certainly we're not giving them a lot of thanks no obviously not no. you know no, when you go on a long journey i think this is what what even turned jeremy clarkson who used to um you know didn't used to be as we were aware such a keen advocate for for nature and suddenly noticed that wait a second there's no bugs on my windscreen you know where have they all gone you know and 20 years ago bugs were everywhere now we don't get bugs on a windscreen and you know it's 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 horrific and it's it, you know and like climate change it's also on our watch so we yeah. need to sort it out we do so so how many how many solar farms do you actually have there? Oh, there's so many other things I could talk to you about. We'll just finish off, and I'll, I'm, if you will have if you would like to come back on, I would love to have you back on again. <laughs> but but how how many yeah, so, solar I've farms? Built, I've built a lot of solar farms. Um, yeah, I, I generally think less in numbers of solar farms and more in you know kilowatt hours of energy. Um, Fair enough. Yes. Gigawatt hours of energy is I guess where we, where we are. Um, and I mean, all the numbers are are in the right right place. We actually recently acquired a solar farm, so our energy needs at this moment in time are pretty evenly matched against what we're consuming across the the network. Uh, we've got some plans to 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 build a lot more um, uh, and consume a lot more energy. We also buy green energy from other people because we don't always have solar energy available twenty four seven. We yes. only ever use yeah. green energy though. That, that's for sure. Um, and you know, we're just on a mission, particularly. Uh, I mean, solar is a, is is a lot more straightforward because you build one solar farm and you can produce lots of energy for lots of charges from it. Mm -hmm. Charges is the difficult one. That's where we talk about numbers of charges a lot more um, because you know, like every to charge a vehicle, you need a charger uh, at least available at, at, at that time. And um, and you know, and when you're on the sites like the motorway network, like we are. Uh, we just need huge amounts more charges. So, so we're on a mission. We, we've got around uh, around 650 odd charges now um, operating. Uh, we're looking to double that, you know, in the very near future. 
uh, and then and then and then and then and then you know yeah so absolutely uh, and they're incredibly highly utilized so in, as well as um as well as uh, putting in new charges we've got you know teams who are operating them who are learning about them we're you know also managing lots of uh, customers people have got who've got um, customer inquiries who if you've got new electric cars and like how do you charge them what do you do and so we're supporting that so we're kind of doing everything we can to um, you know give people the confidence to make the transition as quickly as possible and then when they've done it to uh, you know then become real advocates and tell their friends you know god these electric cars are awesome you know go get one get one now get one you know don't don't wait that's um, what that's what I want us to be doing. Seriously, we're not we're not far off it. And like I said, I will be visiting Braintree in the next few weeks. So, so I I, re- I can't wait. And the education piece, just a little a, a small ditty on that, it's just so important. Mm. And that's again one of the reasons that we use electric forecourts to uh, to talk about electric cars, do test drives, and so on. Because if you know um, how to use an electric car, because um, it's not the same as petrol and diesel. You don't no. need to charge them fully and it takes a different amount of time to charge the 20 last 20 percent as it does the first 80 percent probably around the same amount of time you know the range isn't what people say necessarily you'll get if you drive much quicker you get fewer miles if you drive much slower you get more miles if it's cold you get less if it's hot you get more there's all this sort of stuff and and if people uh, manufacturers of cars and and you know leasing companies and you know car 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 you know vendors and whatever if people just took the time a bit more to explain to people what the difference is about these cars and how to use them to deliver a great experience then people genuinely will it's it's when they don't have this information explained that people just get a little bit concerned and, and what we don't want is uh, is people um inadvertently you know getting a car not really understanding it you know being quite daunted about it and um you know, and not having a great experience. And so it's just really, really important, you know, what you're doing in terms of, you know, your podcast and, uh, you know, and other people out there that we always just take, the, you know, do do take the time to talk to people um, about electric cars and really help them understand how to get the best possible experience from them. Because when you do understand that, it's generally pretty knockout. Honestly, you are so on the, on the, on the button there because I, the, what, the companies that I've been at and I've already had test drives with, I'm, I'm actually there's another pub, podcast episode coming out it's probably by the time this one goes out it'll probably have been out but it was literally about my test drive experiences prior to to now um and and yeah not very, very minimum a very sorry minimal amount of information has been provided and thank god i've been talking to people like yourself you know because actually that that information out there just hasn't been hasn't been shared you know and and i've kind of i've questioned whether the incentive for or there's a lack of incentive really with some um dealerships do you know what i mean because of length of time of actually um purchased for example but you know if the fact that you're supporting people like myself is amazing and i just wanted to say before we finish that i was reading some of the blogs on the GridServe website and actually, for people listening who and watching who haven't actually got very much knowledge of, of kind of electric vehicles, there's things on regenerative braking, there's things uh, on, on char- charging and all sorts of information out there. So, so the fact that you've got people blogging on this, Toddington, is just, it's just what we need. It really is. So, so onwards and upwards, I say, just as a final point, what, what would you like to see in the next seven years? What, what do you, what are your, what are your kind of aspirations, not just for GridSurf, but just what would you like to see happen in the next seven years? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I'd like, I'd like to see us, um, on a path to um to to fixing you know the uh the you know to to actually like we you know there's it all feels a bit hopeless at the moment you know Mm -hmm. and uh and it doesn't matter how much i mean there's some amazing things going on like we talked about electric vehicles and uh and you know there's all sorts of stuff that we're doing you know for every car we lease we plant a hundred trees we play a tree territory to plant under trees there's lots of cool stuff that we're doing but it just doesn't seem anywhere near enough 
the science is more daunting, the time frames are more stretched, and it's just challenging. And so, within the next you know thirty years, it would be great to have turned the corner, and just to be kind of going, you know what, we've got this, we've actually got this, we're going to do it. You know, humanity, you know, we can, we will, we're going to yeah. knock this out of the park. Yeah. And uh, I love the fact that you used the phrase onwards and upwards. It's one of my one of my very favourites as well, and and that's what we need to be doing, you know, onwards and upwards, you know, and it just we need to be charting ourselves a positive, sustainable path forward. And unfortunately, at the moment, the path we're on isn't sustainable. It's going to end in tears um, yeah. unless we uh, unless we collectively sort it out. And it's up to us to do it. And so, seven years is, um, you know, on the one hand, it seems like quite a short time, time, um, but on the other hand. Um, you know, we can achieve an awful lot. At one point, when we acquired the electric highway, we'd we'd we changed 120 locations. We'd upgraded 120 charging locations in 120 days, and so in that sort of time frame, you can achieve an awful lot in seven years. Absolutely. And you know this is the only seven years we're ever going to have to do this again. You know, there is no second chance. Um, mm, so mm. let's make the very most of it. Seven also happens to be my lucky number, so uh, I think lucky that's ten. <laughs> Let's, let's use it. <laughs> you, listen, you are you are doing you are definitely doing the right thing. And like I said to you, there are so many other things that you're doing that that actually, if if people watching and listening have a look at the website. So so the web the web address is is gridserve.com. Have a look at everything that Toddington and the team. So Sam Clark, Toddington. And, everybody and i don't know how many people you have working together you know we have a lot of people and they're absolutely amazing you know i might have some you know some i guess positive and progressive plans um but fortunately we're surrounded by a bunch of amazing people who you know fully believe in the mission vision ambition that we have as a business and uh every day they kind of blow my mind as to how incredible you know they all are and, and all the work that's been done across the business so you know I'm, I'm very grateful and humbled for the amazing work that's going on and delighted to also be on this journey. Well, there are, there are so many people that I speak to and always talk, speak highly of GridServe and yourself. You know, I just, I just say thank you from everybody because, you know, just, just keep doing what you're doing. And, and this, this weekend is, so when we're recording this, this weekend is fully charged in Farnborough. So, so I hope you don't mind, but I'm probably going to come and give you a hug. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> if that's all right. If not, then I'll just have to hug Sam instead, because he'll probably be there as well. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, okay. thank you. I really, really appreciate your time. It's been an absolute joy talking to you and you are, you are an inspiration just like I say, just keep doing what you're doing, Toddington, and and I will definitely be following following what you're doing and and reporting back. And I'll, obviously, when we've when we've been for the test drives over in Braintree, I'll kind of make sure there's plenty of photos out there. So thank you again. Thank, thank you, and yeah, again, and to you, really appreciate uh, having me on and uh, and your your podcast. Also, keep it up. Awesome stuff. Thank you. All right, to everybody else, I'm going to say see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been watching Electric Evolution with Liz Allen. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell icon and you'll receive all of our weekly videos. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye.